Good morning. Let's bow together in prayer. Father God, we'd ask that you would be with us today as we look at your awesome creation, Lord. You are the awesome God, and that is why the creation is so neat. And so, Lord, thank you for allowing us to look into the things that you made and be glorified, Lord, and help us to be good stewards of all of these precious things that you've put around us. And please bless all of the students and their families that are um, watching this and help them with, oh, you know their needs, Lord, so I put them before you and please help them through all of their struggles. Be with them in their struggles, Lord, as you do. You promise to be with us in our struggles. You don't take them away, but you are with us in them. And we thank you for that, Abba Father, our, our Lord and our Daddy, our Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, let's go ahead. We're going to finish up coral reefs today. So uh, grab your Florida waters and go ahead and open it up to page 107 because that's where we stopped um, on that chapter. And actually 106. We're going to pick it up at tropical coral reefs. Um, and so let's go ahead and start there. So we're still in the sponge rock and reef community. And we saw last week that the colonial animals in those situations are the sponges, the bryzoans, the sea squirts, and the corals. And we camped for a little while on the sponges, and we saw that the sponges actually filter the water. And they keep the water clean, but they also get their food that way. And so the water is pulled in, and then it goes out the osculum, I can talk. Um, and remember, they have the little collar cells that are making the water move through them uh, with their little flagella, plural, flagellum is one, and that they have the little collar of cilia around the base of the flagellum where they actually get the food uh, caught and then that will be digested either in the body of the collar cell or by the amoebocytes and then carried throughout. We saw that they had spongin as part of their structure, their skeleton, and then spicules would be the other part of that structure. Uh, and that we saw that a little tiny sponge can filter 20 liters of water in just a 24 hour period. So they're very effective at what they're doing. There's your collar cell. And then remember the amoebocytes actually take the food and distribute it um, to the other uh, cells within the sponge. We talked about that they can do asexual budding through, uh, asexual reproduction through budding, which just means uh, growing a new one, or they can go through sexual reproduction with spawning. And um, here, I may as well show it to you. I didn't show it to you in the last class. Did you guys see the damsel fish that went by there? <laughs> half yellow and half uh, another color. Anyway, all right. So we got to see the sponges spawn thanks to these gentlemen and their hard work. And they got it in 4K, which made it really easy to see. So that was very nice because, once again, I don't want to go snorkeling at night, and these brave souls did. 
and it only happens once a year, so you actually got to see the broadcast spawning on the sponge, the barrel sponge. Okay. We talked about how the sponge was an ecosystem in and of itself that a whole bunch of critters depend on it to live in, that we could shred the, the uh, sponge into little pieces and it would come back together again and reform. It has chemical defenses um, so that it's toxic, so that if something eats it, it will get the toxins, so it's a form of defense. They have a greater mobility in that they can attach themselves to hermit crabs and such, such things. And once again, they support a whole community of life. Okay, then we looked at the, do you guys remember what these are? Don't look, you already looked. <laughs> Bryozoans um, are moss animals. That's what that word breaks down to. Once again, we saw those um, on figure 7-4, I'm pretty sure, excuse me, 7-2. And they are called bryozoans. And they are filter feeders, so they help keep the reef water clean, which is very, very important. And then we briefly looked at sea squirts. I don't know about you, but that looks like star coral to me, doesn't it to you? Looks like they got the little star things going on. We looked at nadarians, and we said that nadarians either had a polyp shape, which would be attached on the basal disc, and that would be sea anemones, corals, hydras, uh, which now you're familiar with, hydroids. Okay, but the hydroids straddle these, don't they? Just like the jellyfish. The medusa is the more jellyfish-like shape. It is free swimming like the jellyfish. And we saw that certain nadarians actually had both in their life cycle, the hydroid and the uh, jellyfish, actually went through the medusa stage for sexual reproduction and then went through asexual reproduction with budding uh, in the, excuse me, they go, yeah, asexual reproduction budding in the polyp stage. And then all um, nadarians have nematocysts, which are the little poison dart cells in their tentacles and remember they can shoot them when the trigger is uh, triggered then they can shoot them it will put the toxin into whatever it's shooting at and then afterwards it will reel it back in and reload it so that it can be used again uh, we looked at the hydroid and here was the life cycle where the medusa goes through sexual reproduction then we have the polyp going through asexual reproduction and so the jellyfish having a very similar lifestyle but they're both nadarians but we see that similar lifestyle in both of those. We said last week that corals need warm, clear, nutrient-poor water to survive. Remember, 68 degrees Fahrenheit or above, so you only see reefs in, in um, tropical areas, and I'm going to show you a map in just a minute. Um, clear water, because the zooxanthellae, like any a, a plant, needs the sunlight to do its photosynthesis. Um, nutrient-poor water so that the competitive algae, the uh, competitors for the space, don't overgrow and kill the corals. Um, and so remember there were hard corals and soft corals. The hard corals are the one that make rock skeletons. The soft corals were the ones like the sea fans, the sea whip, and the feather, uh, the sea feather. And they had little tiny polyps as all corals do. And then the hard corals, which are actually the reef builders, not all by themselves, but they are the predominant reef builders, um, are also called stony corals. They too have little polyps, but they make um, hard little cups that they live in called coralites. And then as they die, the next uh, coral will just build on top of that until they actually build up rock through their skeletons as they build one on top of the other until the reef is actually formed. And there are some other reef builders, which we're going to talk about today, that are on these coral reefs like, believe it or not, there's false coral and there's coralline algae. And so I'm gonna tell you about those today too. Remember the zooxanthellae is the little symbiote. Uh, it's a symbiotic, mutualistic relationship that the zooxanthellae, which is this little um, algae, lives inside of the tissue of the coral polyps and produces 90% of the food for the corals. And you read more about that this week. So, just um, and we talked about last week how the algae gets a place to live and it, it uses the metabolic waste of the coral cells. And then the coral gets to use the oxygen the algae makes, uses uh, the food the algae makes, and that's 90% of the food that the coral uses. And then the, uh, they couldn't, the corals couldn't make the calcium carbonate secretions needed to make that hard coralite rock without the zooxanthellae. So they're very, very important to the existence. That other 10% of the food, the polyp actually grabs with its tentacles. So it is a predator. 
Um, and then some polyps, excuse me, some corals we said could actually put out little gut filaments <clears throat> and grab food and pull it back in. So th the coral too is cleaning the water, helping itself to survive. And then we said that corals actually make mucus so that that mucus can catch any of the sediments or pollutants or whatever that might kill the coral's polyps. And then that mucus is released and then there are individuals that eat that mucus on the coral reef, so that benefits them. We said that if there was too many nutrients, like fertilizer, in the water or cow poop or horse poop or you know from farms is what I'm saying, so manure, any of those that we would think of as fertilizer the algae thinks of as fertilizer too, and so it overgrows the corals and kills them. So too many nutrients in the water destroys coral reefs. And so this is a picture of a Florida Keys coral reef, and here's your coralline algae. And the coralline algae is supposed to be the un unsung architect of a reef because it works with the corals. Uh, this kind of algae actually has little hard plates in it, and when it dies, it, it goes to the bottom and it helps to build the sand that we have at the beaches and stuff and the sand at the bottom of the ocean. So I found that pretty interesting. And this is an encrusted, encrusting species of coralline algae. So once again, you can see that they look hard and that they help to build the reef. Now, when we look at coral reefs, and you're reading, you were supposed to, uh, in the coloring book, you were supposed to go to page 12. And on page 12, it told us about the different types of coral reefs that we see in the world today. Um, we see barrier reefs, and a barrier reef runs parallel to the shore of whatever landmass that it's along. At, but it's separated by a channel in between. I'm going to show you on, on these in a minute. And a toll is a ring-shaped coral reef that has a lagoon in the middle. And then, and actually the channel uh, that is separated from the barrier reef to the mainland is frequently called a lagoon also. And then a fringing reef is a reef that forms right off the beach so that you can walk right into the water and it's there. And there's a lot of these in Mexico and South America and places like that. So they're growing right along the beach. So uh, it's very convenient as far as uh, if you're a snorkeler. Now this shows you the world map where the tropical zone is in this green area, and these yellow areas are showing you where we see coral reefs. And notice that the corals are growing in the tropical zone because they require the temperature to be 68 degrees Fahrenheit or warmer. And therefore, you're only going to see corals growing in these areas where it is warm enough for them. Um, and then once again, the hard stony corals make the coral-like cup that the polyp stays in in the daytime and then comes out at night to feed. Um, well, but I, you know, they're also their zooxanthellae has to get light, so that could be why I seed the little polyps out sometime. Anyway, um, and they, we just talked about that, and there are your soft corals. Oh, and I just want to say, once again, this is a sea feather, this is a sea whip, this is a sea whip, and then the sea fan is the other one, which I don't see here. Um, let me, we'll go through the reef types that we just talked about before we come to Florida. The fringing reef, once again, is right on the coast. And so you can just, uh, here you see it, right along the island. It's right on the coast, off of the beach. And this is a picture of some fringing reef, uh, reefs in uh, Mexico and Central America. And once again, people can just snorkel right off the beach. You see the people at the beach there, and they're snorkeling right off the beach, and there is the coral reef. So. A fringing reef, fringes the land, okay? Now, when there's an active volcano and a fringing reef develops around the active volcano and then the volcano sinks back into the, the water, then you are left with a coral reef that's circular with a hole where the volcano was and they call that type of coral reef an atoll. Okay, so that's an atoll. That was that second type of coral reef. And there's a picture of an atoll. And frequently, um, these things grow enough that they become islands in and of themselves. They're no longer just reefs. There are islands that are involved. And that's what you see, actually, on, uh, in your coloring book on page 12 at the bottom. You see that the edges, which used to be the fringing reef, actually have turned into islands in some cases. And then there's the circular reef around that. So 
Uh, I asked the question because I'm looking at this going, well, wait a second, why do volcanoes sink into the ground? I just didn't understand that. So I looked it up and it said, as a, as a young volcanic rock cools and is carried away from volcanic hotspot by the movement of tectonic plates, remember the, the earth's made up of plates, an island sinks as much as a few millimeters per year. As the island sinks, resonant coral reefs on the island flanks, so the edges of the island, grow upward toward the sea surface while the volcano is sinking downward. And that's why the atoll stays there even though the um, volcano has subsided. So that's what we're being told, how atolls are formed. And then the other thing I wanted you to be aware of is I, I went and tried to do an internet search to see where atolls are located. And more often than not, you see atolls in the Pacific or the Indian Ocean. But there are a few in the Atlantic. There are just not nearly as many of them. And so the most well-known atolls are in the Indian Ocean and in, in the Pacific. Um, and then here's a picture of a barrier reef. And notice that the, the barrier reef is a reef and then there's a lagoon uh, before you get to the land. And the largest barrier reef on planet Earth, you probably already know, I know some of you are going, I know what that is, is the Great Barrier Reef of Australia. And it's right in this area because down here is no longer tropical. So it's up in here, the Great Barrier Reef. And the Great Barrier Reef, you can see it from space on satellite pictures. Here's the Great Barrier Reef. So it's that large. Um, it's as big as 70 million football fields, roughly the same size as Italy, Japan, Germany, or Malaysia. So it's a big reef. Has over 3,000 coral reefs that make that barrier reef. 600 islands that were formed in that uh, barrier reef. Over 1,625 types of fish, so 1,625 types of fish, varieties, 133 varieties of sharks uh, and rays and skates, and 600 types of soft and hard coral that are found there. So this is a large, large reef. Notice that it is, it's got it in kilometers, so uh, I'm going to say it's about 1,000 miles long. So it's a, it's a very large reef. And here is a picture of uh, the coral reef that is part of one of the coral reefs that make up the Great Barrier Reef of Australia. And it is absolutely beautiful. Uh, Belize, which is down in Central America. Here's Belize, here we are over here. So here's Belize down here. And Belize has the second largest uh, reef on a uh, barrier reef on planet earth um, and so you can see the land mass over here you see the barrier reef and then you see the lagoon in between please notice the boats in here for scale so that you can kind of get a feel for the size of this reef also notice that even though you can see through the water very clearly because it's very clear water this boat is running across that so you know that <clears throat> that's all underwater there you're just looking through the water to the reef and believe it or not uh, the Barrier Reef in Belize has an atoll in it, which really surprised me. So uh, it's called Blue Hole Natural Monument, and that is a part of the second largest Barrier Reef. And it's not far from us, right down um, around Belize. Um, and so that would be your Barrier Reefs, your atolls, and your fringing reefs. Now, we get to the next page in your coloring book. So turn to page 13 in your coloring book. Whoops, that's not right. No, it's still on page 12. I'm so sorry, we're still on page 12. <laughs> At the top of page 12, it tells you the reef profile. And so I'm most comfortable with the zones in a reef, okay? So these are the zones. The part that's towards the deep water is called the fore reef. And you'll see all sorts of different types of corals in there, depending on how much light gets down to them. Because depending on what zone you're in on the reef, you'll get a different amount of light exposure, differing amounts of wave action, and different types of coral because of how they can survive these things. And so you find deeper water corals down the, the lower portion of the fore reef, and then you find corals that do better like uh, Alcorn coral, where it's shallower. Then you get to the reef crest, and the reef crest is usually only about three feet under the surface of the water. Sometimes it can be deeper, but a lot of time that's all. And then you have the reef flat, which the flatter portion of the reef. And then at the back end, you have the back reef. So fore reef, back reef, just like we had the um, in the intertidal zone 
we had the foreshore and the back shore on the beach. Here we have the fore reef and the back reef, okay, with the reef crest and then the reef flat. And so when you're looking at a fringing reef, then you have the outer reef or the fore reef right here. It goes in the reef crest, and then the reef flat is the part that we're thinking of that's coming into the land. So that would be a fringing reef. Whereas with the barrier reef, once again, you have the four zone, you have the reef crest, you have the back reef, but then you have a lagoon. Um, and this is considering that lagoon part of the reef flat. I wouldn't. I've, uh, most lagoons don't have a bunch of reefs in them, but I guess some can. And so that's how it would be on a barrier reef. And so this is showing you the four reef, the deeper part as it's going down into the deeper part in the ocean. And um, this, they'd be on the reef flat, okay? So you're looking at the reef flat at this point. Doesn't that make you want to get in the boat and go out there? Uh, it does me. I hope it does you too. You guys, if you haven't seen this stuff, you need to ask your parents to, to schedule a trip down to the Keys so you guys can go snorkeling. It's worth it. At least once, it's worth it. You should see this stuff for yourself. Uh, now, let's look at the Florida reefs. Yay! So we're back home again. So let's look at Florida. We had to get some background stuff done first out of our uh, coloring book because I don't want you coming out of a marine biology class and not knowing the different types of coral reefs that would just be bad anyway let's turn over in your Florida waters book um, to page 108 please now in Florida our reef system the major portion of our reef system goes from Martin County all the way down to the dry Tortugas and most literature, including our book, our Florida's Waters book, tells us that Florida has bank reefs. But from the description we just got, I, if you were going to classify it as one of the three types of reefs that we just said, then Florida has the third largest barrier reef on the planet. And I've read that in places. But people in Florida don't want to call it a barrier reef, and I'm not exactly sure why. But uh, we do have the reef and there is a lagoon. It's called Hawks Channel. I asked my husband, <laughs> so it's called Hawks Channel. So there is a lagoon, uh, which, is, which is a deeper area, and then you get to the reef proper. Now, the coral reefs are on Florida system range between 8 and 15 miles off of shore. So what we see closer in are little patch reefs. And then what the reefs are called by the book and by people in Florida are that we have a bank reef system. And so bank reefs, if you look, I could not find pictures like this to put up there. So let's see what the next picture is. Hang on. This shows you our reef from the satellite. You can see the barrier reef right here. Okay, and the reef structures do go all the way up in here. And actually, we have Ocalina reefs very, very deep. The Ocalina, um, Oculina, I'm so sorry, Oculina reef. And the Oculina is all the way up here, kind of near Cocoa Beach and, and that area. But it lives very deep in the water. And that was on the right-hand side of page 109. I'm going to show you that in just a minute. Um, these are some of the reefs down in the Keys. And our book told us that the largest reefs will be to the east side of the largest keys. Do you guys remember why? I bet some of you do. The reason is the water in the Gulf of Mexico is cooler than the water out here. So the larger islands protect the reefs from the cooler water, which would slow them down. So we get these largest, the largest reefs next to the largest keys so that they're being protected from that cool water. I personally have uh, had the privilege to dive uh, molasses Reef, and I know I've done Fowey, Fowey Rocks before, but that was forever ago when I was a kid. But Molasses I've done relatively recently. Um, hens and Chickens we dive on a regular basis. This is off of Isla Mirada, and it's gorgeous. And then Cheek is like right in here, but it's not part of the bank reef. It's a patch reef, but it's, it's gorgeous also. Chica Rocks is what it's called, uh, and it's made up of hatcheries. So let's, let's deal with this. Um, well, here, I think I have it on a, th a thing. Uh, and this shows you the seagrass beds, the bank reef out here. We've got little patch reaches, re reefs in between, and then there's a hard bottom in your mangroves. So you see on page 108 and 109, the top of the page, that's a bank reef. Now, the bank reef, we're told, can be 300 feet long or more. The top of the reef will only be about three feet below the surface. 
and there'll be channels running through it. And I'm going to show you that in just a minute, but I want to I keep talking about these two types of reefs. I, I want to at least go over them with you. A patch reach reef, excuse me, once again, is on figure 7. Point, excuse me, 7-5. That's your patch reef, and it said patch reaches are hollow, so they offer sanctuary to residents. But patch reaches are reefs are dome shaped, and they're surrounded by grass or uh, sand, and then grass, and they can usually be about six feet high off of the bottom of the sand. And once again, they are hollow inside, and they're smaller. They're round dome shaped reefs, which is. I looked and looked and looked. I wanted to find you a picture because I've seen these. They're so cool because it is a dome-shaped reef. And then when you snorkel over it, you can look down inside it because it's hollow. So they've all grown up around and there's a hole in the middle. And as you read, it's not empty space. What happens is they time share, uh, the creatures time share the patch reach reef where they actually uh the diurnal critters will be out doing their thing in the daytime and the nocturnal critters will be in the hollow part of the reef sleeping and then at nighttime the nocturnal critters come out and the diurnal critters the daytime critters go into the to the uh, hollow part to sleep so they actually time share patch reefs which i found pretty cool anyway so so the Bank Reef is between 8 and 15 miles off the coast. Hawks, K, uh, Hawks Channel is the lagoon in between, which has a lot of seagrass in it. And the Patch Reefs are all through that area. And I guess that may be why they don't call it a barrier reef, because we really do have Patch Reefs inside of the uh, Bank Reef that's along the outside edge of Florida. Okay, uh, so once again, I already told you Bank Reefs are about 8 to 15 miles off of Florida and they're running parallel to the Keys, about 300 feet long or longer. The top's only about 300 feet, uh, excuse me, three feet underwater and it has channels that cross it. Um, and we already looked at the zones in the reef. Okay, I already showed you the pictures there on page 108 and 109. Oh, that's what I wanted to do. So look at uh, figure 7-4. On the left side, it says, at the foot of the reef on the landward side are rubble plains with coralline algae and mustard hill coral. I'm gonna show you a mustard hill coral in a minute. Then the next thing over says partway down the isolated outcrops with lettuce, coral, and others. So there is your lettuce coral. This would be part of your, doesn't that look like lettuce? This would be part of your back reef, okay? And then as you go up the hill, it says six to 20 feet down are elkhorn coral on tops, lettuce coral on the side. So that is elkhorn coral. And uh, the reading told us that this is the only kind of coral that a piece could break off and it would start regenerating and growing a whole new coral, which was pretty cool because a lot of the corals can't do that. And then as you go over, so now I'm actually on page 109, but on the same picture on figure seven, eight, it says the shallow zone has golden sea mat, which I couldn't find that on the internet, bladed, so that's blade fire coral. So that's the next one that's mentioned. Then it said green sea mat, false coral and hill corals. So that's false coral. And so I looked up, what's false coral? It's a mushroom. It's a fungi. <laughs> Isn't that weird? So that's a fungi. That's at least what the reading on the internet said is that false coral is a fungi and that it can come in all sorts of pretty colors, but you'll find that on the reef. And then this is your hill coral, this part right here. That's your hill coral. And so that was one of the ones that was listed there on the shallow zone. Okay, and then you go to the right of that and it says that 20 feet down, there'll be big mounds of star coral. So that's your star coral. We have looked at that before. And then if you go farther down um, in there, you find spurs. And so here are your spur and groove formations in your coral reefs. Now, why this is so important, and you see the, the spurs and the grooves. Why this is so important is because this allows the water to run through the reef and actually remove the waste products and things from the reef. So the spur and groove uh, formation is very, very important to the health of the reef. Let's see. And then, hmm. Okay, that's also showing you, these are both at Sombrero Key Reef in the Keys, okay? And so that's also showing it to you. You see the spur and groove situation there. And this, you know, you're, you're eight to 15 miles out and all of a sudden it's shallow, it's three feet deep. You know, it was 
100 feet deep till you got right on the reef, and then it's, it's really, really shallow. So it's really kind of interesting to see these things. Okay, patch reefs. Once again, that's figure seven, five, and it's dome-shaped, about six feet high. It's got grass and sand around it. So this is going to be in shallower water. It's going to be inside of the bank reef. And that's where I've seen them. And they're hollow inside, so there's time sharing. So we talked about that a little. And like I said, I couldn't find an actual picture of a patch reef that I was satisfied with. This looks similar to what they look like if you're just getting a little piece of it. Please notice that we have sponges here, and then we have some dead coral. We have live coral, looks like anchovies, and ta-da, we got a shark going over the, the hill there. Um, and so we have several things in this picture, but that's probably what a patch reef looks like. Remember I just pointed out hens and chickens, that reef? This, these are pictures of, of some pictures of the things on hens and chickens. And uh, hens and chickens, I'm pretty sure, is a group of patch reefs uh, because when you dive hens and chickens, um, and it is a sanctuary, um, there's a group, like a, a, a there's a reef, and then you'll swim for a while through sand, and then you come to another reef. So I think it's a grouping of patch reefs, and it's much closer in than the bank reef, which is eight miles out. Hens and chickens probably isn't two miles off the coast. So that's why it's very popular, because you don't have to go a long way, and you don't have to go deep to see this. And the same would be true with Chica, which is probably five miles south of hens and chickens. And they're off Isla Mirada. My parents owned a house in Isla Mirada, so we've spent a lot of time there. Thank you, Jesus. That was such a privilege, because they've sold it since, because they're in their older age now. But um, it was a blast. And we used to spend a lot of time on these reefs and taking our kids. And my kids have had the intense privilege of touching turtles while they were snorkeling and seeing sharks and knowing what to do and seeing rays. We've seen the, uh, at um, hens and chickens, I've actually, I'm crying because I feel so blessed, so please forgive me. Um, and I want you to be that blessed. I want you to see these things and I want you to see it and understand and glorify God in it. That's what I want for you. So make sure you get a chance to go. This is not very deep. Uh, Hens and chickens, uh, the reef might be 20 feet down. Uh, Chica, three feet down. You can put your foot on it. Don't do it, but you can. And then if you go north of that in um, Penny Camp, there's Grecian rocks, and there's all sorts of cool reefs there. So you definitely want to take a look and go down and do some of these. This is Elkhorn Coral, and I'm trying to remember why it's there. Well, I already, I already showed it to you once. Uh, let's see. Oh, maybe I'm just showing you some. Okay, so uh, these are some reefs in Broward County. So that's over on the East Coast, up a little ways. And that's just showing you some of the different types of corals that we see. This is off of Fort Lauderdale. It's staghorn coral. This is actually Chica Rocks. And there's your turtle cruising around on Chica Rocks. That's where my kids have ha had the privilege of, of touching them. Uh, you shouldn't touch the turtles, let's be honest. But, you know, my kids are out there snorkeling, and I couldn't grab them because they were away from me. So, and my kids were raised doing this. Um, my youngest daughter, Kayla, some of you know Kayla, um, I had her on my back snorkeling the reef by the time she was two and a half to three years old. I would literally put a snorkel and mask on her, make her stay on my back, and I would snorkel around the reef, and she would look over my shoulder at everything. Then by the time she was four, she was off my back, and I'm trying to hang on to her because she's trying to leave me. By the time she was five, she's chasing fish. She's down underwater chasing fish. So we play, playfully call her a mermaid, and thank God she married a man that loves Jesus and the water as much as she does, so they have a blast. But anyway, <laughs> Chica rocks. A lot of great memories there. Oh, I got to show you this. This is so cool. Hang on. This is about some information on the Great Barrier Reef, but it's really cool. So I wanted you to see it because corals can fight each other and compete. You have a lot of competition always going on. We haven't really um, seen corals as actually living animals that can show responses. Obviously, this is time lapse photography. Sea cucumber. Frustration, really. Um, I started playing with the idea of using time lapse to actually start documenting some of these processes. I'm 
you literally see two corals attacking each other. They're attacking one another. Do you see it right here? See those filaments that we talked about? The coral on the left, you can actually see that it's flashing its tentacles at the other corals, trying to sting it. Then the coral on the right, so it's basically expelling its guts onto the other coral, and then actually starting to digest the coral on the left. So they're having a coral fight. How the fungus corals turn upside down, is moving slowly over the sand bed while being upside down and then inflates itself to flip itself back over. Some of the videos are shot in aquaria, but this was actually using a camera that was set up on the water at a depth of about 15 meters uh, around Heron Island. So it's right around a little over 45 feet. We started to develop cameras that we can deploy autonomously um, for several months at a time. And so they basically are able to take a picture every 10 to 20 minutes and so that allows us to actually look at these coral communities and look at processes literally lasting several months. Isn't that neat? Florida's Keys fish. Wow. The book said that there were over 150 different species of fish that actually inhabit the Florida coral reef system. And these are just a few of the individuals that actually live on Florida's coral reefs. Uh, this. The lionfish, I've told you before, is an invasive species that doesn't belong here, but it doesn't have any natural predators, so it's propagating itself pretty quickly. Uh, the barracuda was one that you were supposed to be able to identify. Uh, these are groupers, okay, and there are different types of groupers, just like there are different types of parrotfish, and there are different types of angelfish. There are different types of snapper, okay? There are different uh, variations of triggerfish. This is a hogfish, very tasty. When I was a kid, we called them hog snapper, but it's actually called a hogfish. Very white, tender meat, very, very tasty. Um, let's see, and then there's a yellow snap, yellowtail snapper. These are your tangs, which some people have those in their fish tanks, so they're pretty common to see. Anyway, and then a puffer fish, there you go, and the trumpet fish you read about, the puffer fish you read about in your um, marine biology coloring book. So we've got all these cool fish that live on the reefs, and some of the ones that you were supposed to read about. Why don't you turn over to plate 47, and there we find the box fish, and it's also called a cowfish, and they can come in several different colors. I was surprised. I have seen these on the reef. They're not very fast. Their little, way, their little uh, fins do like the sculling motion, which sculling means to row, okay? So I had to look that up because I didn't know. So it does this kind of motion. So they're not very fast, although they can get some, some better speed going with their little tail, but they tend to stay near the bottom. Um, and then there is the puffer fish, and the puffer fish, now this is over on spiny tricks. So this was, let's see, 102 in your coloring book, okay. On page 102, we had spiny tricks. And the puffer fish, I had trouble with this because in here it's the spiny puffer fish, which is called a porcupine fish because they've got it under spiny stuff. But we also here in Florida have non-spiny puffer fish. And apparently they're all classified together. They're puffer fish. There's spiny ones and there's non-spiny ones. The spiny ones are called porcupine fish. Um, they have toxins in them and it's called tetradone tetrodotoxin. Uh, it's thought to be throughout their whole body. It's produced by bacteria, but get this. This toxin is 1,200 times more lethal than cyanide, which will kill you. And um, it's the second most deadly vertebrate on the planet, the silly little puffer fish. And the puffer fish, one puffer fish, the toxins in one puffer fish can kill 30 human beings. And there's no known antidote, which means you don't want to eat a puffer fish, okay? And you don't want to grab one or touch one. I was immediately thinking about this guy afterwards. Now, this is a puffer fish without spines, and I was just trying to get you a picture of one of those. And this is from Florida. This was caught in Sebastian Inlet, and that's a puffer fish that does have spines. Now, I want you to think about why this fish has this ability to puff up. It is a defense in and of itself. I've read before that if a shark tries to eat one of these and then it puffs up, it actually can choke the shark. And so they very quickly learn that they don't want to eat puffer fish. <laughs> so it's a very effective means of defense. Um, and then the next one on that page is the surgeon fish. He has spines right back here, and they're actually marked with color in some of them. 
and they can slice you open with those spines back there. So it's a means of defense. And then the last spiny trick it talked about was the queen triggerfish. And she's got a spine here and a spine right behind it. And so um, it is apparently helps them to get into rocks and then you can't pull them out. They can stick those spines up and hold themselves in place apparently. That's what the reading said. So I found that interesting. So triggerfish. And we're going to come back to triggerfish in a minute. And then the last one there is the striped shrimp fish. And it's hard to see. It's in your coloring book on the bottom left of the plate. And this is out of a... Um, sea urchin. Uh, here's your sea urchin. The uh, well, I call them Bahamian sea urchins just because that's where I used to see them. But this is your Caribbean long needled sea urchin. And you can see where this fish would go nicely down in here and just hide out in there. But when I tried to find pictures of it, the only one I could find was shrimp that look similar to this that are also hiding in these sea urchins. So some of them will take up residence there. And then on um, Turn over to plate 109, and on plate 109, you had the barracuda. These were some fishes that were attackers and ambushers. Now, the barracuda runs his prey down. He's a very fast fish. He looks like a missile. I mean, you look at him, he looks like a missile. When he opens his mouth, his mouth opens bigger than his body. Um, I consider these dangerous. Once they get larger, you just don't want to irritate them because if they come and they want to hurt you, they could, <laughs> okay? Most barracudas, though, are curious, but they don't want to hurt you. Uh, what I would suggest is never have on anything shiny when you're in the water. So don't wear jewelry in the water. We take our earrings off. We take our rings off. Obviously, my husband doesn't wear earrings, but us girls. We take our earrings off. We take our rings off. You take anything shiny off before you go snorkeling. And one of the big reasons is because barracudas, they hit things that are shiny, hit them as in, okay? And the reason they do that is because little fish are shiny. So they think they're a little fish. So they see something shiny and they think it's dinner and they hit it. And so I always see these people at the beach that have on all their bling and I think, what are they fishing with their bodies? You know, because you don't go in the beach or the ocean with shiny things on because you look like bait. So use your head, <laughs> don't do that, okay? Leave it at home. Anyway, so these guys run their prey down and they're very, very fast. Also on that page, you have bluefish. And that's what bluefish look like. And I was unaware that they're so vicious. Apparently they go through a school of bait fish and they'll kill actually more fish than they eat, which is weird. Usually natural systems are very efficient, but these guys, well, I guess there's probably scavengers that benefit from whatever they don't eat. That just hit me underneath them. So anyway, that's your bluefish. And these guys also are a slashing attack is what the book called it. And then you have the amberjack. Um, that's a pursuing predator, and they're so fast that the book says that they've been seen eating food from a shark, that the shark dropped, and they're so fast they'll go by and grab it and then be gone. So that's an amberjack. Amberjack are very tasty when they're smoked, too, just so you know. Because smoked amberjack, yeah, that and smoked wahoo. They're like, yay. Anyway, very good. If you ever get smoked fish, if you go someplace and you get smoked fish, cut off the skin and cut out the bloodline. The bloodline is the redder portion of it, which is bloodier. That's why it's called the bloodline. So it's the redder portion. Cut that out, cut the dark away from the skin, only eat the, the white parts. If you eat those darker parts or the parts with the skin, it's gonna taste extremely fishy. But if you will cut those out and just eat the lighter parts, then the fish will taste very nice, especially if you get good smoked fish. If you're ever in the Keys, find Key Largo Fisheries in Key Largo, obviously, and you want to get their smoked fish. It's excellent. But once again, trim away the dark spots. That's very important. Okay, so amberjack. And then... The bottom left has the lizard fish, and I looked it up because this guy that wrote this is from California, so I'm going, do we have lizard fish? Yes, we do. In Florida and the Atlantic, we have lizard fish. Isn't this a strange looking little guy? Look at his big red eyes, okay? Uh, the lizard fish actually like to sit and wait for their prey. Notice their mouth is such that when the prey comes by, they jump up and they grab it. So that's how the lizard fish works. And then this is the frog fish. Remember I told you when we looked at the stone fish, the stony fish, and I said that that was the... Uh, 
not the only one that had the aggressive mimicry. Well, these are both frogfish, and they have a lure here, a little appendage that functions as a lure, and so that way something will come up to try to eat it, and then they'll grab their prey. So that is your frogfish. Okay, then we go to the next page. So turn one page over to pay, plate 110, and the first fish you see there, these are pickers, pro probers, and suckers. Okay, this is a sheep's head. And if you are down here, you'll see sheep's head all the time. I had no idea they had teeth that looked like a sheep's teeth. Or some of the people um, on the internet said they look like human teeth. They do have strange teeth for a fish. So the sheep's head have crushing teeth because they eat sea urchins, sand dollars, mollusks, scallops, all that type of thing. So they need harder crushing teeth. And so they've got these really strange teeth as far as fish go. Um, Okay, and then the pipe fish, which is the, on that page also. Look at this. Can you guys even see the fish in this picture? Here's the pipe fish. See him? There he is. Wow, that's a trip, huh? So um, he's one of these probers and pickers. And then the file fish uh, is also, it, it's mentioned there also, the file fish has incisor-like teeth that are very, very sharp. And they say they're closely related to the trigger fish because they believe in evolution, and that's why they say that. Um, their skin, the filefish's skin, used to be used as sandpaper. Uh, maybe that's where it got its name, the filefish. Anyway, the next one is the forceps butterfly fish. Forceps are like tweezers and so his nose is very reminiscent of that um, and so I think that's where he got that name uh, but his nose allows him to actually get in among the spines of the sea urchin and eat the sea urchin without getting hurt and so that long nose comes in handy for him that way and then the trigger fish uh, the trigger fish is what's called the generalist because he'll basically eat anything. And this one will also eat a sea urchin. Um, it has a tough leathery hide made of bony scales that provide a flexible armor against the sea urchin's spines. And so that's how it can handle that. And it will actually flip them over and um, eat them. So those are your pickers probers and suckers. Then turn one more page, page 111, which are feeding in bony fishes. And these are grazers and grubbers. That's an anchovy. The anchovy actually goes through the water with his mouth open. These are little bitty fish. Okay, maybe that big. And they will eat the zooplankton and phytoplankton. So they're eating, grazing on the plankton as they move through the water. And then the next one you have listed there are, is the parrotfish, who has a very stout beak. And personally, I always get a kick uh, when I'm snorkeling. The parrotfish will be banging because they're feeding, and you can hear them bang the coral. Bang, 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 as they're eating at the uh, polyps and stuff there. These are all different types of parrotfish. Aren't they gorgeous? Um, and I've seen black ones with like neon blue tr trim and stuff. They're just very, very pretty. But once again, they feed on the uh, low growth coral, excuse me, algae or coral, and on the coral polyps for the zooxanthellae. And so that's why I hear them banging um, on the reef. And it tells us that one parrotfish turns one ton of coral reef into sand each year. Wow. One parrotfish produces one ton of sand from the coral reef each year. That's amazing, isn't it? And then we get to the trunkfish, um, and the trunkfish uses that mouth to blow into the sand and move the sand away so that it can find its dinner. And then the bat ray, there's your bat ray, okay? Your bat ray actually uses its pectoral fins to move the uh, sand out of the way so that it can find the mollusks and things that it wants to eat. And it has crushing teeth. Now, I wanted to show you this, and so, um, but we're not gonna be together to do the lab where you were actually gonna look at these, so I've put them here. But these teeth, see there's a dime here, so you can get an idea of the size of these teeth. They're about that big, 
and you can tell they're crushing teeth. That's all they're good for. They look very similar to the surface of, a, of an elephant's tooth or of a horse's tooth or of a cow's tooth. They've got that kind of a crushing type of, of tooth structure, okay? And then the last one on that page is the goatfish. And the goatfish have barbells, which look a little like whiskers, don't they? But they're barbells, that's what they're called, and they have a chemosensory ability, which is similar to how we use our nose, that we can smell things, okay? So these guys can sense different chemicals uh, with their barbells. And so that's a goatfish. And I'm trying to remember, oh yeah, um, <laughs> we were on feeding, silly girl. Um, and so they excavate their prey and then devour the small critters that they're able to find in the bottom. Okay. So then we go on, oh, okay. These are found in Florida Keys waters. These are called upside down jellyfish. He's upside down. So the bell of the jellyfish is here and then that's his tentacles. Obviously, there's a major symbiotic relationship going on with this jellyfish and the algae that lives in his tissues because he's not clear, he's brownish green. And so we're seeing the algae that live inside of it. Uh, they are out of control in the Keys right now. They used to be around, but now they're like everywhere. So it's one of the problems that we're experiencing. Another problem that we're experiencing is uh, the, the corals are starting to die. There's coral bleaching, there's black line disease, there's a few different diseases that are attacking the corals. This is actually a picture at Chica Rocks, which was that place I love so dearly. And some of the corals there are, are dead or dying. Um, so that's why a lot of us are trying to start doing things. This is what it should look like, but that's what it does look like in places. So this would be a healthy piece of coral, and that's what it should look like. Um, that's what you'll see a lot of places, though. That makes me think of Grecian Rocks, which is one of the places in Pennacamp. And when you go there, that's kind of what the reef looks like. Now, there's parts of the reef that are gorgeous. Don't get me wrong. It's worth going to see. But there's a lot of it that's dead. And so if you look at this, you should be able to tell that this is dead. It's white. It's not healthy. And so there are definite problems there. And a healthy coral reef actually protects the mainland. So uh, because it, it keeps the water from coming in and just eroding away at the mainland. So the reefs are very important to protect South Florida, basically. And um, the damaged reefs, they don't give the protection so the wave energy is able to reach the coast and destroy them. So the reefs are very important to South Florida. Okay. So that's our coral reef section. Now we're gonna get ready for our lab. And thank God this one is in a microscope lab, so we should be able to do this one. And this will be our last lab together because after this filming, I'm going to be using old film to give you uh, the rest of the classes that I can. It will not line up with uh, the syllabus that I sent you. And I still, especially if you're in high school, you should still finish that syllabus because that has your tests on it and things. You don't need the actual class period with me talking to you to be able to take your tests. And you, in high school, you need a grade. So, um, you know, those people will definitely want to do that. But this will be our last lab together. This will be our last lab together because I won't be filming anymore because my husband is having bypass surgery in the next day or so. And so I have to be done um, so that I can take care of him. And I know you understand. Um, anyway, so this will be it. All right, so let's look at what we got to do to get ready for this lab. Um, we're looking at squid and octopus, which I told you are called cephalopods, head, foot, because their head and their feet are attached to each other. First time I saw squid in the water, I saw a school of them. I was snorkeling, and I had no idea what they were because look at that. It looks like an alien, something from outer space. And I saw a whole uh, school of them, and there had to be about 50 of them. And first off, I didn't know what they were and that they were really cool, and they kind of look fluorescent. Here, let me show you. They kind of look fluorescent. That's a Caribbean reef squid, and, and they kind of look fluorescent, and they have chromatophores so they can change their colors and look really neat. But what struck me the most was they sat there hovering, and then when they moved, all 50 of them, whoop, 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 whoop gone. I mean, and, and, and they look like one thing. They move so perfectly with one another, which just surprised me to no end. They use jet propulsion, so they have, um, here, you've got, 
a page in your coloring book that you have information. 34. So turn to plate 34. There you go. Um, on plate 34, you have the squid and the octopus. Notice that both the squid and the octopus have the funnel. And that funnel, it's not shown in this picture. I wonder if it, no, you wouldn't see it in the other one. Here we go. Here's the siphon or funnel. And that is what it pushes air, uh, water, not air, water through. So it actually jet propels itself through the water and it can go very, very fast. When it wants to just hover or move slowly, it will use its fins. And you see how you can see kind of the undulating motion there that it's making with its fins. Okay, so if it's going to go fast, it's going to use the jet propulsion from the siphon or funnel. If it's going to go slowly, it's going to use its fins. Um, and so when we look at the squid, it has the tentacles, which are uh, talked about in your coloring book, and you already looked at that. Uh, but it also has two tentacles that are what it uses to catch its food. They are longer than the others, um, and then they have the, the grasping parts on them. There are suction cups on um, all of the tentacles, but these grasping ones are longer. And we'll look at this together. And then the octopus is also a cephalopod. And they too have the chromatophores, which they can change their colors as they go in front of the reef. They can be changing their colors. They're absolutely amazing. I remember reading that the way you could figure out where an octopus was on the reef is look for piles of shells because they eat mollusks and stuff like that. And then they just throw the shells out. Um, so if you look for piles of shells, you may be near where an octopus lives. Uh, remember, they have eight legs. They have tentacles on all of them, both squid and um, all of your cephalopods have eyes that are very similar, believe it or not, to human eyes, which really confuses the evolutionists. Here you have a, an octopus hiding in there. Um, and there we have an octopus. I just want to say one thing. I have had one personal interaction with an octopus when I was a teenager and we were in Bimini. And I still can't remember. We were in the water. We got in the boat and there was a little octopus attached to me. And it, it was... Um, I didn't know it. I didn't even feel it. And when I got out of the boat, I saw it. And so I pulled it off and put it back in the water. But it, it was not afraid of me. It played with me. Now, this was years ago. But I thought that was so cool. So I've always had a soft spot for octopus. So, like, I won't eat them. You know, when people are eating them, I'm like, no, I don't think so. Because it acted like a cat. It was, <laughs> it actually acted almost affectionate. It was only about that big. It was a little guy. Anyway, so uh, let's see what this YouTube video shows us. Okay, octopuses change their color very quickly, as I said. You see how well it's able to camouflage itself. Here is its siphon. Once again, that's where, or its funnel. So it will blow water out of there when it wants to move very quickly and propel itself. But do you see it changing colors? Now the book says it'll actually change colors even if it gets angry or something. And that certain fish can do that too, which I found interesting. Chameleons do that. They, they change colors if they're angry or if they're happy. Now, hopefully you guys know there are some octopuses that are poisonous, toxic. Venomous, I guess I should say. Not, not poisonous, venomous. Um, do you see the color changes this guy's going through? That's what we're trying to see here. Now, squid and octopus have a beak. Squid and octopus both have a beak surrounding their mouth. Um, and so you can't see that, but if you open it up, you could. They also both have the ability to produce ink as part of their um, defense. But do you see him changing colors? That's what you're supposed to be seeing here, is how this octopus just keeps changing colors as he goes along this reef. And he's more than capable of it. And obviously this diver 
is freaking him out a little bit and that's why the octopus keeps moving. Guys, look at the reef that he's on. That's not healthy, is it? Can you see all this overgrowth of algae on that coral? And it's killing the coral. So I just want you to be aware of that when you look at it. Look at him, he turned white. So octopus use their chromatophores to change their color very quickly. And that was over on plate 104, cephalopod magic, 104. And it is like magic to be able to change their colors so quickly. Um, and so on that page, you see um, that the squid can discharge ink and he'll actually change his color so that when he disappears, he'll turn dark. <laughs> Then he'll release the ink and turn light and disappear so that it leaves kind of a dark shape where the, the squid was. So whatever's trying to eat it will go after that instead of the squid. So he actually makes ink and changes his color. Um, okay, I just wanted to show you, there's an octopus right here. He's got himself so well camoed that you can't see him at all. Here's a squid releasing the ink into the water and then he will disappear out of there. For our lab today, we were supposed to do a comparison between the octopus and the squid, but my little octopus are in Boca Raton and I'm in Naples, so that's not going to happen. <laughs> so I do have a squid though. Woohoo! Praise the Lord, Jehovah Jireh. Um, and so we're going to go ahead and take a look at the squid together. And then you can always draw that from a picture. Okay, I'll tell you what. Um, You'll, I'm sure you'll be able to find something like that online, but that's all that you have to identify when you draw the squid is his fins. The mantle is the main portion of a mollusk. Um, his funnel or siphon, your choice. He's got these tentacles, there's suckers on here. And then these, this calls arms. I would call them all tentacles, but arms. And then he's got suckers on there also. So I'm gonna set that up and we'll go ahead and look at that together. You'll draw that uh, and complete uh, what's written there as far as your lab write-up, okay? There we have our squid. And, oh man, can you guys see all the little spots? Those are the chromatophores. Look at that, you can see them all. That's how he changes color so quickly. Okay. And here are his fins. See him right out here? I got him here. I'm going to turn him over so you can see. There you go. See him? There's his fins. And there's his mantle. That's what the thing said. This is his dorsal side. This is his ventral side. Notice here is the funnel or siphon, depending on which resource you use. Can you guys see that? Try to get it so that you can see it. There's the funnel. Okay. And then here we have what was called his arms, and this was his tentacle. Notice it is longer. See how much longer it is than the arms. Let's see if we can find the other one. No, I think it got broken off. Okay. So I don't see his other one. Please notice the suckers on the tentacles. Okay. And, or the arms, I'm sorry and on the end of the tentacle, which seems to be missing. Ah, here's the other one. There it is. Maybe? Nope, nope, that's just an arm that's been curled up. Okay. And then his eyes, remember they have eyes like people. His eyes should be right there, but they're closed because he's dead. So I don't seem to be able to get it open, but you can see his eye right there. Here, I'm gonna point right there. And right here, that's where his eyes would be, okay? And we saw the tentacles. Oh, his mouth, that's what I wanted to show you. Let's see if we can find the beak. So we open up his tentacles, all right? And then I'm gonna, I'm actually gonna pull this all off so I can pull it back. Maybe we can get to see his beak. 
there's his mouth right there see it I don't see a beak so maybe squids don't I thought squids had beaks I know uh, octopus do but you can see his mouth right there can everybody see that here there it is I'll show it to you okay I'm just gonna oh I, I they have a beak it's inside of there I can feel it can you hear it hear it sounds like I'm banging on a tooth so let's see if we can get in there what the heck let's see let's see if I can open him up so that you guys can see his beak there it is this is work oh it's hard oh and I think it just you're not I'm, I'm sorry it's kind of in there a little ways so it's probably not going to be the greatest picture but here it is let's see let's see if I can get it there just pull it out let's see I know in the little octopuses I have, it's actually fairly easy to see their beak. But I wish you were here because you could feel it. There it is. Hear it? It's hard. Up oh, there it goes. So that's half of it. And that's the other half of it. Here, let me move him out of the way. Can you see it? There's the two halves of what was his beak in his mouth. So they do have beaks, so that's good to know. And once again, you can see the chromatophores all over his body. Now there's not as many on the ventral side as there are on the dorsal side, which makes sense. Okay, well now that I've made a real mess, oh, remember they make ink? I wonder if we could find their, his ink thing. Let's look. Okay, there is the inside of the squid. So you can see where his funnel, here's his funnel. Okay, oh, he's smelling real fishy here. Just trying to see if I can find where the ink is. He's got a, uh, you know, they're invertebrates, but look at this. This has got to be some kind of structure to help him like a backbone because I just pulled it right out of the back of him okay so but notice it's not bone so that's why he's an invertebrate but that's uh it's every bit as shell like as his as his um beak it's got the same texture to it and the mantle from what I understand uh secretes that stuff. That is our squid. Have a Jesus-filled week.